for those that don't know or haven't had the time to dig in, uh, but Ian truly was just a mega fan of the Beastie Boys. Um, was it was it was a kid who definitely saw this thing called the internet being a really cool tool, um, and was using some of it through through that and trying to figure out how you know how do you how do you take this passion for the the band the Beasties um, and you built it into music web pages for the Beastie Boys. Um, what was that What was that like getting a call officially from from John Silva when he asked you to come work with him? I mean, it was it was. Um... <laughs> it was like having a call from a parallel universe. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 up to that point, it was hard to believe that that there were even real people on the other side of those records. Um, I think that's actually something the internet's done. It's broken down some of those some of those boundaries so that you do know there's real human beings on the other side. There, you know, it's um, you know, it, it, when I think about what what was being a Beastie Boys fan like in 1991, you know, before Check Your Head, it's hard to remember. But that band was an enigma. They didn't even tour on mm-hmm. on. Paul's boutique. They they may or may not have existed. They were like the force in Star Wars at that point, right? And you know, the internet really, really broke down, you know, broke down those those boundaries in a big way. And I think, you know, the interesting thing for me, and like you said, I just got lucky and and you know need had a I was able to to take my 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 passion, which was music, and put it against um, you know, what my you know, what my expertise was becoming. I was a computer science student in the in the early nineties. And that was good timing. I mean, I'm 41 years old, so I graduated from college in 1994. Um, but over that time that I was in college is really where it came, you know, computer science as a study. From um, you know, interesting to, to, to nerds, to kind of interesting to, to generally. You know, you get people to say, you know, just normal people used AOL in 1994, which was not the case in 1990 when I started. Uh, um so I, I got kind of lucky with the timing of that, but my, my passion was always music. So the things that I did with computers for fun um, were, were always related to music. I think the other thing that, you know, I, I appreciate more, you know, having, having been in a number of companies and had a lot of people work for me over the years and just seeing what makes people successful generally, forget about what your passion is or what your, um, you know, what, what your expertise is. I think that, you know, successful people have a um have a certain profile of, of you know the 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 way they work and their self esteem and you know those their their tenacity and I didn't know that I had had those things but I, I realize now that, that, that you know I that my sort of obsession, you know, my, my anything worth doing is worth overdoing, um, you know, style um said well because the reason I got a call from John Silva was because somebody said, Hey, you know, there's, there's not very many sites about bands on the internet and the very best one is about one of your bands. And the reason I I do think it probably was the best one was because I was nuts. And I thought that any, you know, I I thought that, you know, it it had to be exhaustive and comprehensive or what was the point. Um, So, you know, so that, that's, that's how I got started. But, but the, you know, then, then it was really, again, talk about luck, you know, the luck that, that the man, manager of the band that I happened to make a website for was John Silva, who was somebody who instead of, you know, imagine if it was Paul McGinnis, right, who thinks mm-hmm. the internet is evil, right? Instead, it was mm-hmm. John Silva, who everything is opportunity to John. And yeah. John is punk rock. Um, punk, and John has punk rock roots himself. And those guys really um they honestly believed in me more than i believed in myself and they believed you know you know mike and adam from beast boys had a vision for the internet that i didn't have even Mm -hmm. so i I just got super lucky that i got in with some people who were a really good people um who believed in me but also people who who had a vision and believed in in uh in the internet and you know they really took me under their wing and, and said you know you can do this and we're going to give you a platform to do it with. That's awesome. I, you know, it's funny because reading, you know, knowing you and, and having read that billboard article where it talks about growing up in Goshen um, and the fact that the closest, closest record store was 20 miles away. And most of the stuff that you were digging, you know, especially like, you know, minor threat, you were never going to see on, on um, MTV. And you know, I think, I think that's a, that could be a story told about that kind of world. Now, I think that's an era that's gone by because I think that if someone was to say minor threat to, to my, my 12 year old daughter, she just goes to, well, we're on beats right now. She literally would just go to beats and pump in minor threat and chances are she's going to find it. So 
that barrier has really gone down. But what's really, really interesting is your story about kind of being the, the kid who then go, starts going to IU in Bloomington um, and the way that you started working on in the music library and started taking the, the next workstations and basically created a, a, a beat, if you will, for back in 1992, where your, the students that were on the, on the network could just punch in and listen to whatever that was sitting there. And that just blows my mind. It's like, do you see, so my question is, fast forwarding to current, you know, taking the kid that was sitting in 1992, building that on the music station, uh, or, you know, some type of music station, if you will, for the students, um, I would assume some of that kind of ingrained as you, in 2011 or 2012, start sitting down as a Beats executive uh, and start saying, how do, we, how do we make this the new version of that? You know, it's like, do you see Beats and other streaming services being a way to feed the ki that Goshen kid uh, to be exposed to music? And do you think that that barrier is truly gone now? I mean, I, I definitely. I, I just think, I think that, you know, th there's, a, there's a lot wrapped up in that question because, you know, at the time, yeah. time there really were these gatekeepers mm -hmm. that, that, and the gatekeepers had to do with um, the physical means of distributing music. So, you know, that, that was from a promotions perspective, it was radio. And from a physical perspective, it was the record stores, you know, it was, um, you know, and that was the reason I was in punk rock is because it, it, it went around those gatekeepers, you know, you can read right. reviews in the back of a magazine and then mail order albums, but that's never, never was and never will be a mainstream experience. Um, and, you know, at the same time, like, I, I just believe that, that music is, um, it's just culturally important. Um, you know, there was a, there was a period I remember around 2000, like pre iPod, where I had this real fear i was like wow i'm a music guy i mean i'm literally like the guy that hasn't watched television since 1989 like i don't give a shit i don't like right picture period i don't watch movies i don't watch television i really couldn't care any less um i, I like music and the you know so but i also have had periods where i've gone wow i, I might be on an island <laughs> um you know i'm watching watching people would rather spend money on video games or dvds or whatever and thinking maybe mm -hmm. Music isn't as culturally as important as it used to be, um, but I think that I think that, that that you know with the iPod, you know, and then then just as I thought that, it started seeing people walking around with little white earbuds, mm -hmm. and um, you know the the the, the uh, you know the iPod I think made music showed what how culturally important music is. Um, I think that um, and I think that you know, over the past however many years. You know, as a, you know, you, you mentioned that Sonos video. I didn't, you know, I never had any any personal interest in Sonos other than when I would tell people to get Sonos, uh, they would come back to me six months later and say that their lives were better because they have more music in their life. So mm -hmm. I think that you know, to to answer your question, I remember the first time I saw Ayuma. That was the first online digital music service, the Internet Underground Music Archive, and it predates the web. Uh -huh. And it was started by somebody who I've become close friends with over the years, but I didn't know from Adam. The first day I saw it, his name was Rob Lord. But that, the, for me, the light bulb that went off was that the, uh, the gatekeepers will go away. You know, these people who have been telling us what music to listen to and where we could buy it, um, they no longer have control. So I think everything since then has been some version of that. I think that the, the realization that I've had, and I gave a talk a couple of years ago called The Race to be Trusted, and what I realized was that we actually want, I wouldn't call them gatekeepers, but we want um, tastemakers. We are, you know, mm -hmm. if you look at the history of the internet, the, the, the beautiful thing about the internet is that you've got a lot of stuff available. And I remember, you know, the, the, my secondary uh, light bulb, even back in the internet underground music archive days where realizing that this was possible and then going on to Ayuma and literally listening to every single song, which was possible at that moment, right. and realizing that every single one of them sucked. They were all terrible. <laughs> and, and, I, and I went, oh, wow, if 99% of what the record labels put out is crap, imagine what the other stuff is. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. that was my realization, was that, that there wasn't actually you know, this, this treasure trove of, of, un, of music that was discovered by no one. There was a problem with, you know, the, the music getting from the people who made it to, there's an inefficiency between people getting it to the people who would like it. Um, right. And I, 
I think that, so if we look at the history of the internet where, you know, first all this stuff was available and then it started to get organized into portals via Yahoo and then it became searchable via Google. Now it comes to you via your social network. Um, and, and I think really the next phase of that is about curation by trusted sources. And I think we're seeing that in all kinds of places. I think that if you look at, if your students, you know, if you don't subscribe to Media Redefined um, by Jason Hirshhorn, you should. You know, it's a great, you know, you wake up every morning and you've got 15 or 20 news articles in your inbox. You don't need to go to, to those sites anymore. They, they come to you. And I trust Jason Hirshhorn to, he's just a person, but I trust him to curate my media and technology news. He does a great job. And, um, and I think that that is emblematic of what we see online or what the online music experience can be. You know, I real I had this, the reason I wrote that, I gave that talk called the race to be trusted a couple of years ago was, um, because I realized that, that as digital as I am and have always been personally, um, and as much possibility as the internet gives us with respect to music, I was still getting all my music recommendations from a, a print magazine from the UK. You know, Mojo magazine will come to the house every month and I'd go through the reviews in the back, just like I used to at Maximum Rock and Roll. And then I'd go to, mm -hmm. you know, Mog and type in the, the, the artist name and make a playlist out. You know, it was like, and, and you know, I, I one in every 10 records would become a discovery for me. You know, and mm -hmm. nine of them, I'd be like, oh, that's not for me. But then you get that record that, that blows your mind and that keeps you doing it. Um, and, and so, and, and to be honest, I came to beats because I, I had a realization that this was the opportunity to do that. Um, yeah, there's unfinished business and it's been kind of groundhog day for me because I've always been, I've just done this, you know, that, like you said, I mean, I, I, I built my first search and stream system in the early nineties and then was yeah. part of Winamp in, in the late nineties and then built Yahoo Music Unlimited for Yahoo, uh, in 2005 and built, a, um, you know, another web streaming cloud player in the early 2000s. So, I, you know, I definitely, um, I feel like it's kind of all I've ever done. In way, yeah, yeah. Right? But like the part that's most interesting to me is how do you, how do you, um, how do you help people find great music? Um, you know, and, and for me, I, I just, you know, it's, I, I love, um, I love getting great stuff from great, Mm -hmm. that's where that's where discoveries come from yeah yeah I, you know it's, it's interesting you, you talked about you feel like it's groundhog day but it is interesting because even in this course material uh looking at stuff that mike king or somebody else has written even even as quickly as last year or the year before already as we're teaching it i'm finding it gone oh wow things change so quickly so I can only imagine, as you talked about, you know, going back to even before the iPad was ubiquitous of, of everybody having it. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, it's like a third eye on everyone's head. It's like the world has totally changed to to have the iPod, and then you come to 2014, and it's like the concept of of the technology is so much better now. Yeah, I could see that it's sadly. I just think our technology is getting so much quicker and better that it's almost to me cool that you've been able to kind of plug out of an existence and then kind of plug back in. Like I said, you've got this under underlying current of you have a vision and it's, I think it's pretty impressive that, you know, that vision is still being applicable to the technologies as you come across them. So I think it's, I think, you know, quite honestly, you know, knowing you, when I heard that you were going to beats, uh, I was excited because I still, I still was waiting for something to come because I still haven't been blown away by every streaming service out there. You know, I, to me, I'm a tangible, I'm staring at the vinyl on my, in my collection. I, I want that, but it doesn't negate that I want to have an environment where I've got three kids um, and I want them to be able to have no barriers to get music. But you, you hit the nail on the head. I want them to have a curation because, you know, they're not going to listen to what old man dad has to say about, you know, bands. And, you know, if I'm raving about, you know, I don't know, Fagazi to my boy when he's 12, will he like it? I don't know. But if he can find his Fagazi, you know, or his minor thread, that'd be really cool. Um, so, yeah, so I think that, that that's the challenge that we have is as we, as we almost dehumanize the process of people not being able to go into physical stores anymore, and that, that distribution channel is, is, is so much smaller than it once was, I would love to see that be replaced in such a way that some type of curation or, or some type of uh, fan um, kind of grouping together could, could come to that. And, and, I, and I wonder, I do, I, you know, it, it kind of leads me to another question is, is, as we've seen these changes over the years, I think the fans and us music people 
you know, we've always wanted this. But I think the reality of it is the infrastructure of the music business has not always wanted it. And one of the things that stuck out to me was, you know, reading reading an interview with you about why you went from Yahoo to um, to Topspin and the fact that you were so sick of dealing with the kind of the, the mentality of the labels not getting it. So, you know, in theory, you know, putting your finger up to the man at the label in the Topspin world to go to the bands directly, and that's how I started working with you, um, is I had all these bands that said, we, we're sick of the label telling us what we can and cannot do. We're independent now. Screw the label. We just want to go directly to our fans, which I think is great. But now we're stuck in the paradigm where it's like, okay, but in order to make the best service out there, you had to go back to these labels uh, and get back in bed with them. And I know that you, you mentioned earlier in your history in this interview about, you know, when you were dealing with the beasties in Capital, you know, capital was flipping out when you were trying to do these MP3s online. And they're like, you know, your comment was, why would a label get in the way of its own artists? But sadly, I think that's the question that everybody still says to this day in 2014 is, why is the label getting in the way? But I think it's turned into, now is the label getting greedy? I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the things that came up in this course was about the streaming services. And I think, you know, everyone's heard Tom York and other bands bemoan, um, the the lack of transparency or the lack of of kind of leveling if you will of the playing field for all musicians so be it a beastie boy or be it j coils you know garage band in nashville tennessee you know nobody's treated equally it seems um so that you've got these people crying foul and saying you know we can't how can this be the future of the music business if we're not going to treat our artists equally you know when with those type of two that's a two-part thing you know how do you deal with the labels and the licensing world because you went with that with Yahoo and kind of stepped away from it with Topspin, but then you had to fight against it with Topspin to get them to play ball too. And now you're definitely in bed with the labels again. So how do you deal with that? And then secondly is, is how do you battle that conversation that the Tom Yorks of the world are, are you know, saying how evil the streaming services are and it's the, the death of the, the middle-class musician. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, for me, the, the, there, there had to be a big change before streaming services would work. I mean, we we we, were la- we launched a, uh, an unlimited streaming service at Yahoo in 2005, and I think there were two um, problems at the time. You know, one was you just didn't have critical mass of the way that um, the way that music would be consumed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had a streaming service, but it really only worked on your desktop computer. There was there, the smartphone did not right. So w- without the smartphone, you weren't going to have a successful streaming service. We had these, we had this subscription ecosystem with these portable devices. With, uh, you don't even want to talk about it, but it was a big deal right. at the time. It was Microsoft DRM, and then you had devices by Creative and Samsung and Toshiba and iRiver, and you know, there really was this promise of subscription music um, that we all bought into, but it was just too early. You know, a- Apple was too dominant. And um, and the hardware, the technology just wasn't good enough mm-hmm. yet to be to be ready for mainstream. So that one people didn't really want; they weren't really committed to spreading yet. Um, and that that took um, I give Spotify a lot of credit for this. You know, that took a lot of experimentation for them to see that this could scale, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you know, you, you'd have you had this philosophical idea that if we could just get you know the, average consumer doesn't spend that much a year on music. Um, and if you could get that spend, you know, for a number of people to be a hundred dollars and above, um, that, that you really could grow the music business through this idea of subscription. That was sort of a philosophical argument at the time, but no one had seen it happen yet. And, um, I think we've seen that happen in Scandinavia over the past five years. And, um, and that's been, that's, what's been really exciting. And, and the labels have as a result, completely change their business model mm. or completely embrace that business model as part of their business model. Right. And they'll tell you, you know, the labels tell you directly now, which wasn't the case when I left Yahoo. Um, but I've had labels say to me, we are betting our business on subscription. Right. Wow. And, um, and that's exciting that when that, that means that what they're doing is aligned with what I'm doing and that's mm-hmm. exciting. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, on the way out um, to where I am right now here with my family, I had a conversation with um, with uh, with someone company talking about a new feature that we want to um, release, and they proactively called me to tell me how excited they were. I mean, the, wow. the, the tables are completely yeah. turned around in terms of of them wanting to do innovative things 
there are always challenges and it's their job to protect um, the copyrights and make sure that, that we don't exploit them. But the good news is I know that if I develop a feature that's going to drive subscribers, that, that they're, that they're going to support that. I think yeah. that the real challenge um, for all of us across the industry, it's sort of flipped to the consumer side now and not the label side. Um, and I think that, that we all have, um, you know, I think that, that there's been a pretty big disservice done to music generally. I mean, you know, we talk about our history a lot, but I'm, I used to go to Aaron's records every week and spend a hundred, 150 bucks on vinyl. I made $36,000 a year, right? Like that was, it was a major expenditure for me. It was a big part of my, um, you know, of, 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 of my, what I spent my disposable income on. I didn't have nice, I didn't have a bed, right. But I, I went and spent that kind of money on, on, on music. Yeah. And now we're in this world where, you know, you tell people you're going to charge $10 a month for all the world's music and they act like that's too much money. Mm-hmm. And I, I gotta be honest, like, I, I, I just, I just disagree. I, I think if you're the type of person that'll spend a thousand dollars a year on cable television and you won't spend a hundred dollars a year on music, then we can't be friends. Right. Mm-hmm. We, we, you and I look at the world so differently and we value, you know, culture so differently mm-hmm. that, um, I don't even really, I don't relate to you on any level. Um, so I think we really have to change that conversation. I think if we do, I, I really don't think there's an issue at the artist level or the label level. Um, now, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, from my experience, the issue that artists have with streaming music has everything to do with free. What they're doing, what, you know, what, what, what artists are doing is they're looking at their bill or that their statements uh-huh. and they're seeing millions of streams and a tr- trickle of revenue. And right. I think for the most part, that's because played on free services, you know, they, they, you know, on free services, whether it's radio or, um, you know, or, or ad supported subscription, you know, ad supported right. unlimited streaming services. They, they just don't pay that much. Whereas, you know, streaming you know, for paid streaming pays about a penny a play. Um, and, and I think that there's, you know, that I think that that's a, a, a very fair rate. The other issue of course, is you don't know what, you know, the way it works for me at the end of the day is I write a check to a label label mm-hmm. that has to account artists. I have no idea what happens in that last step. Yep. Yep. And, but I also, you know, this is something I learned at Topspin. I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for an artist who did a bad record deal. Right. I mean, I, that, that's not something that I can control as, as you know, or that I should be penalized for right. you know, the, as a, as a, as a music service. You know, I mean, I, I remember even at Topspin, a major, major, major artist who was upset with, you know, the, the campaign that we had run with them because of the way that the label needed to be involved. And I, you know, I was like, I, I understand that you're upset. I have no idea why you'd be upset at me. Um, right. you know, and I think that, right. that that same thing applies, applies here. I think that, you know, so I think if we can really, you know, parse out the issues, um, you know, to answer your first question, if, if we win, labels win, period, mm-hmm. all labels, so it doesn't matter if it's my favorite secretly Canadian in Bloomington, Indiana, or universal music mm-hmm. group, right? We, we, if, if people play your record, you get paid right. period and you get paid a fair rate. If we can convince, you know, millions or tens of millions of people to, to pay, uh, you know, 10 bucks a month or a hundred bucks a year for, for music, which I, I, I think we can. And just a digression on that for a second, you know, just remember we have 26 million people in the U S paying $13 a month for satellite radio. We've got 33 million people in the U S paying right. for Netflix. We have a hundred million people in the U S paying an average of a thousand dollars a year for cable or satellite, which as I said earlier, I think is a, is a total waste of anyone's time and money. Um, so, you know, I think that, I think it's really, and I think that also we know that that, that thousand dollars a year is going to get unbundled, right? What's going to happen is people are going to, instead of paying a thousand dollars a year for a bunch of crappy channels on cable, they're going to pay for Hulu, Netflix, mm-hmm. ESPN, HBO, and Beats. Right. And that total package is going to cost them 40 or 50 bucks. And I think that's right. very, 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 very reasonable consumer behavior um, that frankly is going to bring people a lot more joy than what, than what the thousand dollars that they're, that they're spending now. Um, and, yeah. and, and the, so I, I think that um, the, uh, you know, 
the, the then on the artist side of things, what if I were if I were an artist? I mean, being honest, what I what I would do is I would I would say that you know if you 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 can't stream you know my full album for free. Yeah. It's that simple. You know, you could listen to it on the radio, or you could be a part of a service that um, you know that gives you all the world's music for a reasonable price. And and if that's the case, then you're going to be much happier with with your your per plays. And it'll help us scale the business um, to a place where, you know, there's there's a big enough pool of revenue that that people are excited by them by their month by their monthly or, or annual statements. Yeah, and Ian, I think you know you said it so well. And just to clarify for everybody that's listening here, is that you know Beats Music does not have a free premium part of its subscription. So it differs from a Spotify of the world or Pandora. So obviously, you know, Ian talking about his views, it's very important to understand that when, when a when an artist such as Tom York and Radiohead talks about the negativity that they see with Spotify or uh, even, you know, for uh, Aaron uh, McCollin, who talks about it in the class and she talks about transparency for payment to, to the indie artist, as I said that and Ian clarified, you know, it does have to be a separate conversation because a premium model is existence on giving stuff away for free. Um, and I think, I don't think it's at un, unrealistic at all for anybody at, in this call to, to talk about spending money on music because I think, you know, we have to, we have to have that mentality of, of, of supporting the artist. So it, it's great to hear you say that, Ian. I'm, I'm glad to know that, you know, and you, yeah, sadly, you do bring up the last part of that kind of chain is like you pay the labels and what the labels do based on their relationship on a contractual thing with the artist is totally out of your hands. Um, and, you know, I think, Sadly, that begat the, the, the kind of rape and pillage, I, I would say, of the 80s and the 90s and the 2000, early 2000s when the, the labels were printing money. Um, it's sad that that's, that we're still dealing for those sins now, but that's not. Yeah, and I think that's true. I think, you know, the good news, you know, the positive side of it is that um, there, there are, you know, the artists have a lot more leverage today than, than, they, than they used to. Um, mm-hmm. They can get so far on their own. And I, you know, that's a, it's a matter of degrees, right? But you know, people talk about Trent Reznor, who, you know, did so much direct to consumer and then ultimately went back to, to Sony and, and Columbia for his last couple of records. Mm-hmm. And, and people talk about that as, as a as almost like a uh, admission of defeat. And, and the fact of the matter is, I mean, you know, that the deal that Trent got is completely different than if he had records on his own. Right. 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 He proved that he has this connection to his audience and he can walk in there and do and do the right kind of deal. Um, that has the that has the components um, that he needs, and and that you know it's not the case for every artist, but you know even if you I had dinner two nights ago with Brian Klein, um, who manages Fits in the Tantrums, mm-hmm. and you know that's just such a great story. You know that could be anybody's story. You know M- Michael Fitzpatrick fits. You know he's he's a couple years older than me, um, and he's on every festival this summer. Yeah. He, he you know he worked as a as a he worked behind the scenes as a music engineer his whole life and always had this dream of doing this sort of neo soul thing. And, and he's doing it on a, on a grand stage, like literally yeah. at this point. And, you know, Brian, who you, he, I have an interview with him on this week in music that, that people can watch. It's one, one of the most watched ones on there, I think, but he's just the greatest, one of the greatest, you know, managers um, and talk about, you know, tenacious and what he's done with Joe Purdy and fits and he's about to do with this new group future user that he has coming out. Like he knows how to do stuff in this new way. And, and, you know, you know, the deals that he's been able to do for fits, they don't look like those deals that he would have done in the nineties. Right. I mean, they do deals on their own terms, right? Because they know they have the means of production. They have the means of distribution. They don't need, um, they, what they, what they need and want is they want help with marketing and distribution. They want to share the risk and share the reward that's no different than me going out and getting investors for my startup. That's what you do. You share the the risk and you share the reward um, because you can't do it all yourself. Um, But, but it doesn't mean that you have to get screwed in the process. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you bring up, you bring up, I have actually, I I actually have a question which ties in perfectly with the fits and the tantrums kind of thing. I was actually exposed to fits through top spin. Um, So I was one of the, the first, you know, I jumped on the download widget so I signed up to an email list and watched their career progress. But one thing I was always impressed with is they, they gave so much free music away, live versions, live from House of Blues. 
So from a, from a perspective of marketing, I was so intrigued by how they hand, handled that, that more importantly, yeah, they were able to bring that data to the label and say, look what we've done. Great. So, so with that in mind, I think everybody that's in this class at one time has probably used a Toshman E4M. Uh, I think, you know, I've used hundreds of them. So as we look at the streaming world, what do you see as a, as a kind of replacement or is there a replacement that what we can look to from Beats? Uh, from other streaming services, how do you acquire new fans now if that conversation kind of goes, here's my music, give me your email, give me that data, because right now there's there's data that can't be received from these streaming services. So us, the indie music people, don't have access to that data. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a huge opportunity, and we're just, we're really just getting there, and it's the reason that we just bought Topspin and have, you know, all those great folks like like Parker, Parker mm-hmm. and others in the company now. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the it, that was the opportunity that I saw. I was like, you know, it's almost like what I was doing is just looking at my own music experience and seeing how disjointed mm-hmm. it was. I was getting recommendations from Mojo. I was using Topson for direct to consumer. And then I was using, you know, Mog for my streaming. Right. And just like things are not connected in any way, <laughs> shape, or form. Right. So I, right. I get an email in my inbox from this artist, and now maybe I can go. You know, or I just went through this. The new Jonas Policewoman record came out two weeks ago, and I get an email from her mailing list, which I'm on, and then I go to to Beats, and I'm like, "Do we have this? I don't know." <laughs> you know oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> now I'm right. out of it. I, I share it with with friends, and the fact is, I should have just got a notification on my phone the moment it was released. Yeah. Um, you know, we know email open rate open rates are crap relative to you know, getting notifications in your apps or text messages anyway, you know, email open rates are 10 to 15%. Right. So, you know, we know that email is not the efficient channel um, that it once was. Uh, you know, so it, from my perspective, if I can integrate those top spin offers into Beats Music, which we've done, mm-hmm. and if I can integrate that conduit where an artist can communicate directly with their fans in the Beats Music, which we've done, we have this follow construct um, mm-hmm. inside the app, then we've, we've replicated a lot of what we were trying to do at Topspin just inside of the app because it's really mm-hmm. about getting directly connected to the artist and then giving the artist a platform to communicate. And, yeah. you know, we've done both of those things like this much, like, you know, to, to a very small uh, degree. I mean, you can follow, you can get a notification, you can, as an artist, merchandise if you've got a T-shirt or a ticket or, or whatever mm-hmm. inside the app. Um, you know, but, but there's so much more we can do. One of the things that, that is a big deal for us that we, we really want to do is, is, you know, what you just mentioned, just giving people data. One thing we, you know, we didn't touch on earlier that, that we've done that was important to me is we're the first service to pay all of the indies, the same thing we pay the majors. That is huge. One of the ways that um, streaming services uh, make up a couple of points of, of margin is by screwing independent labels. And I just think it's offensive. Um, so, you know, we said, look, we, we, we were going to pay everybody, everybody the same and in mm-hmm. Indies, you don't have to fight for it. You don't have to ask us for it. It's just the right thing to do. Right. Um, so, so we're going to do that. Um, you know, the, the other thing that we want to do is to give everybody data, yeah. you know, if awesome. we can give you, you know, who, let, let us show you how you're, how you're getting played, where you're getting played, are people clicking, you know, all that sort of stuff. If we can give you that data, then hopefully you can make better decisions and, and, you know, grow your, grow your fan base. I mean, to your, to your point about fits, um, you know, it's a, it's a grind, right? I mean, there's no, you know, and if you look at, and if you watch that interview with Brian, one of the most, one of the things I think that he did with fits, that was just the most interesting is he'll tell you he really released that EP quarterly as if it was a brand new record. Yep. He was just he just pretended it was a new album. He was like, it's new to most of the world. So yeah. I'm just going to do everything I did when I released it again. Yeah. Yeah. He did it over and over and over. And there's no way around it. It's a grind. Like, you don't just show up to the Ellen Show day one. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But he did build it and he did get there. And so if, and we can't, we can't make that happen as beat mm-hmm. music. But if we can provide you those tools so those who have the talent connect with an audience, and are willing to do the work can grind it out. Right. Right. That's, that's really all we can do. 
Right. And I think, you know, so I, I love to hear the fact, I mean, I, obviously I know that Topspin has been purchased and you have the, the artist link uh, flow through. So there's that transactional conversation that's going on. Um, but I love to hear that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect less from you that you're looking at how to serve those fans, but then how do you acquire fans and how do you give and empower back the artist? Because that's been the biggest fear that I've had, not from beats perspective, but just in general, um, you know, as I teach these courses, I'm always using my experience with Sloan and Jars of Clay and the President of the United States and all three of them just get so beyond frustrated because we have no access to data from iTunes. So that's still the largest place where, you know, these transactions are happening. Um, obviously, digital sales are going to go down. So if, if the replacement is something like a beat that can eventually give me data, then, you know, I think then it's the onus is like you kind of said, the, the onus is on the music band to actually pay money. Then I think it becomes the onus on the, the marketing brains behind a band to say, stop driving everybody freaking iTunes and drive them to something like Beats where you can have the data flow so that you can make better, better educated conversations with your fans and making sure you're offering, offering the right products so that there can be more money. Um, you know, I think that's great. Now, one question is, I would assume, and Mike King asked this, do you see as more users get onto the platform, the rates that you've negotiated, that flat rate with everybody, will that increase? Well, will it increase in terms I, of like the, over, over time? The, over time, what we pay the labels will go down. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, it 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 has to, to be honest. Okay. It's, it's not. It's a. It's too. As as the you know the the over the total money pool will go up, but on a on a percentage of revenue, I think it has to go down. I think that it's it's sort it's sort of artificially high at the moment, um, mm -hmm. thanks to the major labels. Um, and I think that you know with volume, it'll it'll decrease somewhat. Um, I think the other I think the other thing you know I, but the, the 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 pool will increase so that you know it'll it'll ultimately be what it what it means is is that we'll have a big music industry at that point. Um, yeah. the, the, uh, um, you know, but to I mean, if maybe Mike's question was, well, our total money is paid to artists. They're only going to go up from here. Okay. Uh, you know, I, yeah. Cause um, it, and yeah. And so basically you're talking about margins when, when, when Mike and I were, were thinking it was actually like a, like you said, a point zero zero percent or whatever. And you're saying our, our pennies, you're actually saying it's percentage. It's not an actual number. That's right. I mean, actually, yeah, there is the it just and just to be clear, there there actually isn't a per play rate in a service like ours. Okay. Okay. There is on free services, and it's sure. crap, which is why yeah. free services are bad. <laughs> yeah. So on on something like us, it's strictly percentage of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, and, that makes sense. And so so you you know what what we want is we want total number of people paying to increase and for the companies like ours to have enough margin that we can continue to build great products. Yeah, absolutely. No, you've explained um, it. Totally, totally get that. Yeah. I was misunderstanding um, the, the payouts there. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's, yeah, believe me. It's, um, and, and the way that the free guys pay is, is intentionally confusing. Oh I, yeah. Yeah. It's intentionally exactly. complex to mask the fact that, you know, they aren't, they aren't paying enough. Yeah, and at the end, at the end of the day, any argument that I've ever heard from somebody like Chris Moon to even somebody like Tom York has always been based on the that mentality of the Spotify model is is very 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 built upon making all this money and they're not giving it back to the people that own that that content. So they're making on the backs of the content, they're making all this money and they're not they're basically not doing what it takes because they're on this premium model. So they you know Spotify to the world bemoan the fact that, well, they're giving the music for free, so they have to pay so little. But then, you know, I think it is an earth shattering mentality to come along and say, there will be no free version on beats. But then when you explain why you won't, it makes to me, it's common sense, but just yeah, way and I, I think that's why I think it's, I really do think it's on the consumer. I mean, I completely understand why free services have done what they've done. I mean, look, you sure. have, you know, asking people for a hundred dollars a year is, is a big ask for, for, a, you know, and, and there's a genuine question of, you know, how, how, how large a market is, is willing to pay that. I think we, you know, we, to that end, we do need other, other paid models. I think that $10 right. a month, is the only paid model, um, forever. I think the fact that, you know, I think that that's where, where, where iTunes really has it right. You know, the ability to just get a song for 99 cents, it's not a big burden. Well, they really feel like they're getting value for it and they're getting good convenience. So they're 99 cents and they build a great, a great business based on that. So I think that we do need some, some models that are, you know, that are 
that are not just the $10, but I think the other thing that we have to do is we have to really provide a lot of value for the 10 bucks. And that comes in the form of curation and a great app. Mm-hmm. And, but also in, man, I'm a $10, I'm a paying music subscriber. I should get money. I should, I mean, I should get um, music everywhere I go. I mean, when I go to pitchfork.com, why wouldn't I just be able to play everything? Right. I'm yeah. paying, you know, a membership should have its privileges. I should never right. see a 30 second sample, you know, anywhere in the world. You know, I'm, right. I'm, I'm one of those people that pays for music. Great. Right. You know, I like, it up for me everywhere. I've, um, I've got a gold pass. I, I think that, uh, yeah. And I, and I think, I, I, and I think the thing that, that's why the thing that worries me is this, this macro issue of, um, how do we change the conversation from, you know, oh, that, that music, oh, you can only get a 30 second sample looks like a surgeon general warning. And it really feels more like, man, you're crazy. If you don't, if you, if you, if you're right. not one of the people who pays for music, you must not really value music. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, I think, and I think that, very few people would would say that they don't value music, you know. And, right. and so I think to, right. to point, point out to people what a tremendous bargain, a hundred dollars a year for just sort of unlocking the joy that music brings you. Um, sure. I think that if you if we change the conversation to be that, you know, that's why I joke and I I you know when people ask me why we don't have a free service, I show them the uh, baby making music playlist. I'm like, if you, if you, if you're asking me for an ad in this playlist, yeah. then you and I live very different lives. Right? I don't know how, how right. you make it to this playlist, but it's obviously differently than I do. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, Chris, you had a question. You raised your hand. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think, I don't know, from my perspective, it's almost shift from an artist's point of view where that data is more important than the argument that everyone seems to be continuously making, which is about the micropayments and a little yeah. bit of money that comes in. I mean, the exposure is really important, but getting to that audience, as we were talking about, Ian, before you even uh, logged in, just how hard it is to get any traction with the audience you build up on Facebook as far as, you know, social media push. Mm-hmm. I, I think access and data is far more valuable long term to an artist than any of these micro payments. I mean, the way you guys are doing it beats and leveling the ground is, is awesome. And as it scales, everyone will win, which is a different, totally different and needs to be said um, than ha- any other streaming service, premium service. But um, as a, both an artist manager and, you know, the, the data heavy centric nature of what we do with artists at noise trade now, I, I'm just all wrapped around the data more importantly. I'm really excited that we're beginning to be in the age of, hey, we're going to share some data with you. We're going to show you where your listeners are. So there's some there's there's an, an eccentric long term value to that more than, you know, the argument is still being made this narrow minded, I think, on on the payment aspect. Uh, you want to have a career in this industry. You got to got to know who your audience is and how to get to them and worry about the money later. Yeah, I, I think I think you're 100 percent right, Chris. I mean, I think because I, I think also, especially at the early stages, and the things that worry me more, I do think that there's sort of an increasing divide between you know the haves and have-nots in in the um, in the artist side, and um, and I, I I worry about you know what the scale of of payments are. Um, for people who are not the top artists, that, and that's that's something I think we'll just have to keep an eye on and watch it play out as time goes on. But I, I completely agree to, agree with you. Like the, the value is, mm-hmm. I mean, it, another way to say it is that sort of always existed. I mean, how many independent mm-hmm. artists do I, do I know who iTunes is, is? It's a for them, it's a distribution platform. It's about making their music available. It's never been a big check, right? right. Um, and and they they rely on other on other other forms to to um you know to have their success whether it's you know playing locally or more more regional tours or whatever and if we can give them data to support those things to support you know another way to look at it is this that future music coalition study on artist revenues from a year or so ago um showed that you know for an average for the average artist that they polled um, 6% of their revenue comes from recorded music. So mm-hmm. another way to look at it as, as Beats is to say, okay, well, Beats, what are you doing to provide value in that other 90%? Mm-hmm. Right. right. Because if you're not providing value, if you're not providing data that helps them tour, if you're not providing ways for people to, to upsell to merch or vinyl or whatever it is, then, then, you're, then, you're, then, you're, then you are a sliver in 6% of the business. Right. Right. So, you know, the opportunity for us is to is to give you is to become 
um, integral in your career in other ways, you know, your, your, or your, your job as a manager in other ways. And, and I agree a hundred percent that, you know, giving you access to data is, um, is a key way we can do that because even at a relatively small user base, the, um, you know, you, it doesn't take long to get to critical mass on the data front. Um, so the data that I can provide you is tremendously valuable about which song is working, where, et cetera. Um, and, and, you know, that's, it's just, it's trivial for me to give, to give you that we are, and we already have the interface for you to log into now that we own Topspin. So we just have to get the data literally that is sitting in that right. database into right. that interface. Right. Fun. When is the, well, speaking of which, Chandler asked, when is the artist link uh, kind of flow through going to be go live on Beats, or is it already there? It's there already. It's okay. there. It's there on Android. Um, oh, on Android. And, and okay. it'll and it'll come on iOS over the next just couple of weeks. Okay, so iOS. That was the question that Chandler had specifically. Cool. Hey, here's a question that that came in from one of the students. Um, it talked about um, what what's your what's your thought on kind of you know, the, the, using the, the single menta mentality that lives in, in the downloaded world or even the kind of more DJ world where you have a single, you know, what do you think of launching one song on beats as a single? Is it effective uh, in your mind rather than a whole album? Or is it like YouTube and you can just have one song to make it work? I think it's effective. I mean, we see people, you know, launch singles all the time. And we just promoted the new Black Keys single this week. And, um, you know, the EMA single, you know, was, mm -hmm. was one that I discovered on, on beats through our promotion. Um, and I, I think that, you know, that, that, that notion of, I, I definitely, I feel like, you know, the, the idea of launching one song at a time, um, you know, really has its place, uh, especially if it's the kind of thing you can get blogs to write about because, um, you know, it, it, I think that there's a, what I definitely wouldn't do is if I had an album with seven singles release one single on the whole album, you know, I know I just think from a PR perspective, you're going to get one very quick cycle out of that when you could get this build of, you know, song after uh, song after song. Uh, if you have something that, that people really like, you just got to give people more moments to talk about you. And if you can build a little bit of, of um, suspense and cadence to the story, I, I think that, I think that always helps, um, you know, if, 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 if people are interested. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, there's another question that came in. It might have been answered before, but uh, it says, from 2013 to 2014, my independent label was primarily pulling 90% of their sales from Beatport and iTunes. Uh, this year, we've seen streaming media really turn into a force on, our, on their royalty statements. Streaming services have been much more friendly with direct label and DSP relationships and providing direct deals. How do you believe distributor aggregation services will hold? Do you believe they'll hold a vital role in connecting the two together? So the question's about about distributor aggregators like in grooves and and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that I mean I, I kind of hope they will to be honest for um you know for our sake. Um, <laughs> I think that I think that they provide a really valuable service in in a giving leverage. You know I mean mm -hmm. I'll tell you you know doing a deal with uh, an in grooves or Merlin is uh, is a lot more work than doing a deal with a small label no leverage. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in a good way, it's for the label, right? They have leverage, right. so they demand a great deal. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, services like Merlin and Ingrooves, they provide a really, a really vital service, um, you know, for, for the indies. Or even Secretly Canadian, who has, you know, great, great, and they do all of their own delivery and that. And, and it's good for us, too, because it gives us one, source to give data and and whatnot to and 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 they can um you know it's just it's just going to work better and the service is going to be better if if they've got enough critical mass to be um you know to have a weekly meeting with the, with the service yeah yeah do you i know you're currently doing you mentioned the black keys uh you know do you envision and hopefully it'll get better but um you know I really, you know, this is just me personally talking. I want to see you guys succeed big time. I think what you guys are doing is amazing. Um, I actually have a Beats shirt on right now representing, um, you. you know, uh, but it's it's one of those things where I think our battle is, is out there. It's it's a really hard thing to kind of get these these consumers that have had free music for a long time and are used to free to kind of go, oh, shit, I've got to pay for something. But 
do you have an, an, an vision, a vision for beats beyond the, the data, which I think is so crucial as, as Chris alluded to, do you find yourself becoming more focused to, for, I, 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 this is going to sound wrong, but to be a replacement to iTunes in such a way that I know that weekly iTunes is going to, or, or Amazon is going to market to me as a consumer. And they know that I've purchased this, or, you know, I've, I've purchased the zombies. I've purchased um, Motorhead. I've purchased this. So they're going to give me based on that. Are you going to then continually do that so that when I open up the app, you know, there's going to be, well, you listen to this, so you should listen to this. Or for that matter, the new Black Keys, I don't, I don't most, I'd rather see that kind of pop up as a promotion so that I know that there's a new thing out. So maybe I can slowly turn off iTunes. You know, do you, do you see that happening? Um, hang on just one second. No. <laughs> no, never mind. I think I missed, I missed the boat. My, my daughter was trying to get me food. Oh, uh, sorry. No, you'll be right. you'll be off the phone in a minute or two. Don't worry. Um, I was going to say. I mean, look, we're already doing that. You know, with, mm-hmm. with um, you know, with, with the just for you. Uh, you know, yep. is, is, is the is the thing that we try to show you first when you when you open up the app. Um, and yeah, we we will. You know, we we have. You know, we have a lot of what we're. I mean, I've got rap songs for rockers. Uh, <laughs> a lot too, and Slick Rick. So I think yeah. they definitely have my number. And yeah. then. Uh, and then Bowie Stereo Lab and Leonard Cohen. So I, they, they definitely yeah, yeah. know. Uh, and then yeah. you know Velvet Underground, Tom Petty and uh, um, uh, Kanye. So they definitely seem to know what you cool. know. Seem to know what I like. Yeah, and I think that getting that right is is exactly it. I mean, it's that for us, it's that combination of 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 curation and personalization is mm-hmm. exactly what we're going for. So every one of those. The albums that's sitting there was picked by a human. Every one of those playlists was made by a human, but they're bringing me the ones that are, that are just right for me. And, and that's what, you know, that, that's, that's what, what we do and, and what we, you know, what we want to do. I think that, I don't think, you know, there's a the, the study just came out again this morning. Um, no big surprise. Number one music discovery is FM radio. Right. Human, human curated playlists, you know, mass broadcast. Um, I don't think it's really a mystery and I don't think it's, I don't think, you know, as, as great a distribution mechanism as iTunes is, I don't think anyone discovers music on iTunes, right? You go there, you look at the bricks and your the bricks reflect what's happening in culture generally. Right. And you know, you're, when someone clicks Drake on iTunes, it's not like, Oh, I wonder who this Drake guy is. They heard him on the radio. They saw him on Saturday Night Live. Now iTunes putting you in front of it, putting in front of you. Right. It. Um, right. The, you know, I think that, that, you know, I, at the same time, you know, we have some people who have done radio for a long time on our staff. And, you know, one of them who was on Power 6 in L.A. for 17 years said kind of incredulously in one of our meetings a year or so ago, which will always stick with me. He goes, it's no mystery how people discover music. You play them a song they like, and then you play them a song you think they're going to like. Yeah. Right. It really is that simple. Um, and. You know, I, I think that's where, you know, playlisting as a format, you know, really comes into play. And, um, you know, it's, it's you know, you, you can, you listen to something that it looks like you're going to feel it. And maybe there's a couple songs you recognize. It feels like the right direction. And then there's that song in the middle where you go, wow, what is yep. that? Yep. And then you, you know, go deeper. It's just, it's not, you know, it's uh no, look, I grew up I grew up obsessively making mixtapes for friends. I grew up with every girl I ever courted. With my wife to this day, she makes fun of this literally four mixtapes I gave her when we started dating. Like these that's how I that's how I speak to people. I speak to people through music. So, you know, that's why I love the human element that you guys bring to beats and 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 beyond being a big fan of you, uh, I think I think beats has a huge success, you know, at their at your fingertips uh, to build the right model to really engage with people. I think it's awesome. Um, the, the last question I wanted to throw at you was you're right now just in the States. Do you have plans for international? Yeah, definitely. So we'll, we have a deal with, you know, Mog is in Australia right now with the telco there called Telstra. Okay. So we're working on getting beat music to Australia with, with Telstra right now. And, and that will come before too long. And then, you know, we'd like to be throughout North America and then, we, you know, in, in Europe, our, our, our strategy is, you know, to go where the beats brand is strong. And, you know, Beats is incredibly strong in the Americas and in Europe, and it's gaining um, strength in, in Asia and, and South America as well. But, you know, mm-hmm. when, when you look at, you know, Beats as a number one brand in the UK as an example, you know, that, that makes it a, 
a prime target for us. Yeah, awesome. I'm sort of so excited to hear that. Well, listen, I know I've kept you for the full hour. I told you that I'd try to get you out of here faster than the hour, but I do appreciate your, your ability to, to jump on with us this morning and take some time out of your personal life to, to come chat with us. But man, it's, it's been great to, to, to know you and, and to see the, the great things that I thought you built at Tospin and, and love to hear kind of the bigger plans for Beats. And I wanted to last say for everybody that's in the States, um, you can get a free subscription to Beats uh, if you haven't jumped on the service. And everybody that's on this chat should do that. Um, get used to the service that, that Ian and his team are building. I think it truly is the way uh, that we can do so many of the great things we want to do as, as, as music students to, to, to reinvent the wheel of the music business. But I also think if you've got kids like myself, I know Ian does. I mean, it's going to be so important to, to kind of teach our kids the value of music, but also the exploration of how to find things. I think it's a really cool thing. Uh, anything you want to leave us with, Ian, as you wrap up? No, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, watching both of my daughters make playlists is is, is a blast. So, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, I think that's that's where it, it, needs, it needs to end up. So I'm lo- just looking at the chat to see if I'm here. But I, I think, you know, I just really want to say thank you for you guys. I mean, Jay and, and Chris and, and Mike, you've all, I, it was such big, big support. And I, I really, really appreciate it and appreciate some beats as well. Cool. That's awesome. Well, Ian, we'll talk again soon, very soon. Enjoy your weekend. And everybody, thanks so much for, for joining the chat. And like I said, check out Beats Music, get on that service, and, and let's start making this thing a success.